Yeah, so what we do is try to use a deep neural network and try to, our main in idea is rather not to do the face recognition specifically, but try to bridge the modality gap between the two different modalities, so long wave IR and the, the visible. So our idea is really to have this kind of nonlinear mapping between the two domains, <coughs> between visible and thermal domain, and we do it via a fully connected feed for deep neural network. So it's really the designs, interesting design steps that are important rather than this deep network. So this is really very vanilla network, no big science here. Okay, so uh, very quickly, what does network uh, in the training, we try to learn a parametric nonlinear perceptual mapping function in the hidden layers. And uh, the parameters of these, this function, which really we are trying to learn, are optimized via uh, this kind of objective function, which is basically, basically simply a squared loss between the two, two uh, modalities. Um, so for a meaningful training of such a uh, system, <clears throat> uh, we came up with this idea of uh, 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 decomposing the images into very small overlapping patches and analyzing it different, at different scales. Because at this problem, we don't have much data. So the only representative data is few hundred or thousand images. So to have a meaningful training, we generate about one million vectors on the facial images from corresponding regions on the two images. And then this helps us to capture the perceptual differences quite well. So with differing uh, characteristics, and then the, this whole network is trained by minimizing the loss. Okay, so then since we have learned our mapping function, <coughs> Uh, as I said, it's not really about invest, uh, investigating uh, fancy face recognition technique. We just want to see how effective the mapping is. So we simply compute a standard different distance between the two facial images. Although with the same vectors, since they are mapped, we can do any kind of other stuff like uh, LDA analysis or some partial least square or Bayesian matching or anything. But here we simply compute a distance with just one matrix vector map multiplication. So the nice thing about all this uh, setup is that we just learn the mapping and map our database images once offline very quickly and then online in the real time where the thermal heat signatures are coming, they don't need any mapping because the mapping is learned from the visible to the thermal domain. So the, our thermal, pr the gallery, images that are the visible images, they are already close in resemblance to the thermal images. And so we just map directly the thermal images. Yeah, so this is really fast then. Okay, so just very quickly some uh, experiments. We use this uh, data set from University of Notre Dame. It contains both the visible and the far end thermal, thermal images of the same persons, multiple number of subjects. Uh, to compare it with, uh, we also use the same features, but without our learned mapping, just to so to say how effective the mapping was, right? And then we uh, analyze how much effect has this modality gap and how much identification or verification performance we could get out of it. So here is the images from the data set, and this data set is really challenging because it was recorded back in 2003 with those at the sensors available at that time with long wave IR sensors at a distance of two to four meters with in different settings. So the thermal images have different kinds of expressions, even at different distances and different are taken at different times. So it makes it really very hard problem because it then have very wide modality difference, resolution difference. As you can see, the visible image was 1600 by 1200 pixels, while this long wave IR images, they were only 300, around 300 by 230 pixels. So overall, we totally have uh, around 4,500 such images from 82 subjects. We divided the data set in half, used one part to train the system and the other part to test. So this is the standard setting what the previous approaches has to do is just so to compare them with the state of the art. Okay, so before we input all the images to the network, uh, we, there is one thing that this pre-processing is really important. So we have to uh, first locate the face and align it and then do some nice pre-processing. 
a simple pre-processing step basically mean filtering to remove the dead pixels from the facial images or and do some difference of Gaussian filtering to bring out all the little edges in the faces. So, this is the input to the network. Here you can see images from one another subject in the database, but you can already see the challenges. For example, here the facial features are no more available, right? But in you can bring out some detail here and even this fake moustache effect and the far infrared uh, sensed images. So, this really is difficult to map even for the humans. I mean, this is something. Uh, one thing that for the other kind of computer vision application, we always have human performance in mind, right? We want to do as better as the humans can. But here, in the if you typically see this heat signature, uh, it's really even hard for humans to just look at the heat signature and then try to pick up a person from a visible database that this is it because the facial features are really changed. So here, to show some uh, some some results. Uh, uh, so, the we tested this with just having one visible photograph in the database, having two visible photographs in the database and having multiple photographs of a single person in the database, right. So, all these settings are important both for surveillance and other applications. And this one is the state of the art which just published. So, from uh, Sean Hu and colleagues from US Army Research Lab, they just published these results on the same database with the same setting. So, we our very initial results of the this new method came about I mean it is already improving 10 percent in all cases right and this is like as I said not really the face recognition, but the mapping. So, if we can just top it up with some nice face recognition it can or it can go better even in our shallow configuration with just one hidden layer of the network our results are really better in all the settings. So, this setting here with when you have multiple images per subject is also important for some nice applications. For example, <coughs> today's age we have social uh, networks, yeah, Facebook stuff. So, it is really relatively easy to have multiple images of a person in the database, yeah. So, then if you have multiple visible images, your accuracy is really nice. I, was, I will show you in this curve here while this is comparing our baseline with the mapping in different setting, but the, the nice thing is this top blue curve here. It is showing if you have top 10 matches, how is the probability of finding the right person in those top 10, right? So, it already shows that if you have multiple images in your database, visible images, uh, there is I mean you are already 98 percent correct in the top 10 matches or 100 percent correct in the top 20 matches. So, it is important for, for this kind of uh, search things, right? it shows pro quite promising results. So, the nice thing about all of this as opposed to the what state of the art is that it is really computationally very efficient because of the design steps we have. The training time for the model is about 1, 1 1.5 hours on some standard multi core processors. And since we do not need to carry on the models at the test time, test time we do not need any model. So, the test time identifying one thermal test image and matching or finding its identity only takes about 35 milliseconds. So, this means that it is really very fast capable of running in real time. So, if you have now cheap LWIR sensors in your mobile phone, you can even you know run it on your standard mobile phones as well. Okay, so, um, I will just quickly show you some very nice interesting uh, video. Basically, this shows you what kind of challenges the thermal uh, images might have, what kind of applications a little bit and uh, what uh, other issues, legal issues you, you might have. Yeah? So, if you are exercising, your thermal heat signature totally changes before or after the exercise. So, this brings about the challenges in the problem, right? If you see here, or if you are in an emotional state, yeah, so even then your thermal, at least for now we know that <laughs> when you say I am hot, it is really literal, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this also brings about some, some of the interesting debate has been going on ever since this work came in the press. A lot of people are talking about the privacy and legal issues. So, while I am no, no expert, but I just included quickly some of the experts what they are saying about this technology we developed. So, Timothy Yim, a startup policy lab, he obviously they have privacy concerns and he is more concerned on 
and the kind of correlations that we are able to now draw between the two different modalities. So, what kind of information that could be yeah, that could come about by exploiting these correlations. Similarly, the big brother watch obviously have many problems with it uh, understandably. So, they are they commented on BBC about it that there should be legislation for to cover it. But interestingly, uh, Jeffrey Wagel, who is an executive director at uh, Center for Technology Innovation at University of Pennsylvania Law School, he, he actually said that it would be really difficult to bring up a privacy action against it if he can use because of like same similarly like you use it for, for the number rate recognition or other surveillance stuff. Yeah, so well, uh, it is their problem while they are debating. Uh, we can find some interesting applications for this kind because basically we are able to now exploit the correlations between the thermal and the visible data. So, there opens door to many exciting applications uh, besides face recognition. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and besides really computationally efficient, it can be used in different many different applications. So, I will be happy to talk about after the end of the session if you have some ideas or you want to uh, collaborate with us on some projects or stuff like that. But yeah, we can say with, with these very promising in, even initial results that uh, this is just the beginning. So, face recognition can finally really work in darkness with your ordinary yeah, equipment. So, that is about it. If you are interested to read more about it, we just published the paper two weeks ago at a very nice uh, premier British machine vision conference. It was very well received there. But before that, we had quite some press coverage. Some things are there, but there are many other makes interesting read. Nice to read some comments.